This clip from the SVLG Cities Matter Summit is brought to you by Google. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, being able to join you today. And Michael, um, who I've known since he was a mere child, it's lovely to see him. And um, and also something you may not know about Michael, uh, in addition to all that you've heard about him, um, he is a wonderful uh, father. And you'd have to ask Jen if he's a wonderful husband. I, I guess he is, but I know he's a great dad. And so, Michael, I'm excited to be able to talk to you today. Cindy, likewise, it's always a pleasure to be with you and I'm honored to have this opportunity. I was Thinking back of our relationship, two young Democrats, I think you and your wonderful husband were courting at the time. And, uh, you know, it's always great to, to hang out with a fellow Dem in our wonderful uh, South Bay city of San Jose, which I know you and your family make your own. And it's just a, a privilege to be with you. Well, I'm excited to be with you, too. And, um, and one of the reasons, and I, I know many of the people who are with us today know this, that um, you are, in many respects, a pioneer in San Jose, and your development career has really been, um, you know, pre-RDA when we had redevelopment agency, now post-redevelopment agency, and all the new tools or the lack thereof that is needed to really do the developments that are difficult and challenging that you've been so willing to take on. So I'm really honored to get a, a chance to have a conversation with you about this. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is, how do you pitch transit-oriented development in, um, you know, as you're trying to get investors. And how do you pitch San Jose? Because I know you are Mr. San Jose. Well, thank you. I, I like to refer to myself sometimes as, as Midtown Mike because <laughs> uh, during the last Great Recession, it was very challenging to pitch San Jose, Santa Clara County to investors and uh, to get them to understand the vision of what uh, San Jose is and could be, especially coming out of the financial crisis. And so it, it was difficult. In fact, I remember uh, being actually on, on Wall Street um, in 2007 and watching the Lehman people pack up their bags and leaving and people were crying in the streets and I was, I couldn't wait literally to escape New York. But when I was there, um, the vision of transit oriented development was evolving um, and it, you know, at the time we had purchased the Valley Transportation site there at Sonola and West San Carlos with Swanson Companies. And I, I just couldn't get people to understand how an old cannery wood plant could turn into this, you know, vibrant area of the city. And so um, we're kind of on our own because you mentioned redevelopment was at that time starting to go away, and it was difficult. But uh, the perseverance, I think, of the region's economy and what people really started to understand that technology would shape not just the job front but also Wall Street. I think that um, a lot of uh, real estate commercial developers like myself on the apartment side, you know, started to see that, you know, there was a great story here and that people need to take transit to get to A to B. So um, we were fortunate that the timing of this, and like they said, sometimes timing is everything in life where it's better to be lucky than good. But I think good is preparation. And, and because of the general plans, specific plans like Midtown, that allowed the investment to, to be cultivated. So we were fortunate to have that. And so I'll put a question back to you that probably is in the same vein. And, and you know, you have been part of these, uh, I think you were part of the Midtown specific plan, maybe back on council and, and some of those great specific plans. But I mean, why should, it, you know, now moving it forward to today and after all we've learned, you know, uh, as, as former chair and, and current board member of the VTA, I mean, why should developers continue to bet on uh, transit oriented development? It, you know, that's an excellent question. I mean, I think one is that I, I think it's going to be a necessity. I mean, here's what we know. We know that 7 million people a year die from fine particulate matter, and that comes from cars that are, that are fueled by gasoline. So in many respects, it's really about saving the planet and doing it in a way that really sparks the economy. And I think one of the things I think is so exciting about the work that you do, Michael, is that I think you help people see the opportunity. And at VTA, we have 26 sites that are, you know, in multiple jurisdictions. So one thing I would say is that we want those sites to be able to be, um, in some respects, flexible. And that's something actually I'm learning a, a lot about relative to the way we put out RFPs and RFQs, because we want to be able to work with the city 
the jurisdiction that that site's in is critical. And then be able to do something that lifts up the surrounding community, but does it in a way that really, really will encourage the use of transit. As an example, I think you've made this point to me many times that we know that jobs near transit increase ridership even more than housing near transit does. So that's something that we have to keep our eye on. And that second, we need to look at building communities that are very, very diverse, right? So that you're not just having retail, but you have retail with family housing, retail with, um, you know, with some, maybe some business component as well. So we've got to be okay with mixing it up and really working dynamically with developers, the city and BTA to get the most value we can from these lands. Couldn't agree with you more, it's important. Well, I actually think, Michael, that's a lesson that you've been trying to drill into me. So well done. Congratulations. You know, um, one other thing I'd be really interested in hearing your perspective on this is that when you imagine how we think about infrastructure for this region, what are the, the, the core components of infrastructure you think we should be investing in as a region? And how do you think about, has that changed for you pre-COVID to now? Excellent question. and. It's interesting. It, I, I think the big infrastructure item that has me concerned is electricity and water. Um, electricity, because we've kind of gone a little bit extreme, especially in the city of San Jose with the, the new reach codes, um, which I understand the environmental reasons for that. And you mentioned carbon greenhouse gas emissions. But the problem with that is it's literally not as easy as just flipping a switch. Um, and, and I think the building codes and, and what it requires now to eliminate uh, natural gas, uh, which is a very you know cheap uh, type of you know uh, empowerment of, of any building. Uh, for example, water heaters are you know most efficiently run, run with natural gas. Well, for the reach code, you no longer can use uh, natural gas to power that building. So that that one right now concerns me, and then the, the current state of affairs with the Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, you know, you when we have rolling blackouts, when we have wildfires and their infrastructure is old, you, you, and then not to mention their service levels can be challenged as well. Now, by the way, I, I want to applaud the, the great employees of Pacific Gas and Electric. I have met some incredible hardworking individuals, both in, on the field and the lines and in the administrative office. But it would, I'd be remiss if I didn't say as, as a developer to say that there are serious issues with Pacific Gas and Electric's infrastructure. And then the idea that we're only now going to use electricity as your sole source of powering a building, I, I think there's some serious concerns that could happen in, in an earthquake. I think there's serious issues that, as, as well as an equity issue on what people can afford, um, you know, apartments are, really our first time home buyers are our apartment owners. And so they all have meters and they all pay their own electricity. It's not like it's a group electricity rate. They pay the same rates as a single family home ownership. So what's the effect on their on their bill in the future? So I, I would say that my biggest issue right now, and when I look at sites, I'm concerned in San Jose that I think they've, they've jumped into this reach code really fast. Um, we're finding that uh, you know, there are the building departments are, are having a hard time interpreting that on the electricity or standards. And so, look, we have to build infrastructure for electricity, for our cars, for our lifestyles. But let's make sure that we're doing it in a meaningful way where we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater with, with, with the cost side, which we know we're always challenged. Um, so I'll kind of pose that question back to you as, as, as a you know, key elected official. Um, you know, what do you think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion about infrastructure, especially at the federal level. Mm -hmm. How do you think those infrastructure items are going to affect Santa Clara County and greater California moving forward? You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, Michael, and I know you um, and Jen are, are um, you know, know a lot about the history of California and in particular its political history. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot about was former um, um, Governor Brown, the first Governor Brown, and, and right, and remember that he built out, he had a vision for roads that would connect the whole state, and he really kicked off the development of our higher education system and investing in primary education, and 
you know, then he looked and said, well, how, what can I do to bring the best and the brightest here to California? And what am I going to do to make sure goods and services can be moved from point A to point B? And he had a vision around that. And I think when I think about the future, I think the point you raised, Michael, that's so right on is that redundancy is core to resilience. And so when we think about the future of the state and the future of our region, we have to remember that what attracted businesses here eons ago was steady energy and clean water. And the point you raised about what do we need to do to, to um, enhance those, we need to invest in, um, in energy and I think building in redundancies for energy because I think the primary energy should in fact be electricity, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of investment that needs to be done to make that the case. I think the second thing is we have to have a diversity, right? You still need to have some gas, you're still gonna need to have some diesel, you're still gonna need, I mean, we, we've gotta think about the world in a, in a much more cafeteria style that, that really does protect the environment. I think it's possible to do both. But I think the other point you raise, which is we've gotta be building water treatment plants. Like Anderson Dam, I know uh, Congresswoman Lofgren's been playing a leadership role in making sure we, we're rebuilding that. That's a 10 year project. We have got to be moving it to make sure we're building in these projects. And, and then the last thing is, if I'm to think about the highways of the future here, one is we need to make sure that all of our, our um, freeways and through, through fares are designed to allow us to have electric cars and lots of other kinds of vehicles, because this is all gonna happen in a layered, textured way. Um, but the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about is you know, the point you raise around building out our water infrastructure. You know, we're going into another drought. And remember that just in this year, we dealt with COVID-19, power shutoffs, heat waves, and smoke, all at the same time. And that didn't count the other natural disasters we know we could be facing, such as an earthquake. So building out resiliency, equals redundancy, and I think investing in our community in a, in a really smart way, which could include broadband, which is something I wanna to talk to you about, because if you think about it, the highways of the future, it is broadband. It is broadband being integrated into our communities because now people are gonna be looking for clean water, a great environment, a place that they can live, be, you know, have entertainment, be with great schools, um, ha have access to reliable energy, and they've got to be connected more here than anywhere in the world, right? Um, so I'm curious, how do you, how does broadband play in as you're thinking about the future of the state of California, and even as you think about where you invest and why you invest? Great question, and you and I have had this conversation on other wonderful panel panels by the leadership group about you know the shifting patterns of migration not just uh, where you live, but where you work. And, and of course, more people now are going to have hybrid schedules. Um, and you know, kudos to you, you've worked hard with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and the great companies in this region to really mitigate, which could have been an incredible disaster. And I don't think you nor the Board of Supervisors get enough credit. Uh, you know, I think you're measured by, hey, what's gonna be, you know, when are we gonna get back to normal? That's the, that's the standard. Well, that's a hard standard to measure. Maybe if we brought it back down a few notches, I think you've been a leader uh, in making sure that Silicon Valley is open and is, is open for commerce. And, and I want to applaud you and, and your fellow board members for, for making that a central part with a work from home and making sure that the Silicon Valley you know, didn't just lay off people. I have to be totally honest. I was very concerned at, at the outset of the pandemic that too much work from home would create a possibility of people being let go if in fact the economy went you know farther south what we learned from this though from the data was that actually silicon valley took off greater and so uh we're, we're you know have new shift in patterns from from both your commute to obviously from work from home and to your question and point that the home now is the office and the office is the home so if you have an apartment complex a single family home what have you where you dwell you have to have sustainable broadband service and great connection and literally it could be the difference maker in an apartment community which is if i move in the first thing i need to know is who's my provider and how am i going to get connected 
And, you know, there's a lot of independent companies running around right now um, that want to make, you know, that are, will provide this service, but if the infrastructure is not there, uh, it can be a problem. And, and that's an equity issue as well, as you know, in our east side San Jose communities where I know you've been a champion for many, many years that making sure that, you know, I always tell people that I want to find more east side properties to develop because, A, I, I, everybody needs a place to live, and B, it's an opportunity to bring more services to those communities, mm -hmm. which desperately needed, especially those those communities that are you know disenfranchised where they don't have uh, the schools open right now. So I, I think next to probably to your point, next to, to to power and to water, I think you've got to put that in the conversation. Broadband, you're right, and and so to that end, um, how I mean I've seen this Biden one point five trillion dollars, and by the way I'm a huge proponent of any infrastructure bills. Are you seeing, as a county supervisor with your staff, are you seeing how this can get to the county and the city levels? How, how is that path going to be connected? Because I think some of us in the private side have a little bit of like, oh, geez, we're going to 28% tax, blah, 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 and not really understanding what the actual benefits will be to, to people, you know, like you and I that live average lives. I mean, how do you see this connecting the dots with this new infrastructure proposal? Such a great question. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, Michael, the, the point you raised too about like how how um, how important this is, right? Garbage, water, sewage. I mean, this is what you get connected to at your house. That, that is a really, really good point. And you're right, we need to think about it that way. Um, what's exciting that they're looking at is giving money um, in, into states so that we can do the micro trenching and the investments in the in the um, infrastructure that we need. And one of the things I think we have to remember is that cells haven't advanced far enough yet to meet, to take care of all of our needs. As an example, the county in partnership with the city of San Jose um, spent, we spent over $7 million on Chromebooks and hotspots. And what we learned is the hotspots don't work everywhere because you really need that broad, broadband infrastructure built in. And remember too that broadband built, you know, built right moves at the speed of light. And that, that really has to be our standard. Because the other point you're raising is if you're working from home, you could potentially do your doctor's appointments from home. You could have another person working from home. And interestingly, as people are going back to school with these hybrid models, one of the challenges is do the schools have enough broadband to have the capacity to do these hybrid models of education? And again, to your really important point that we talked about earlier, if we're building in resiliency, we're building in redundance, which means that we're creating the flexibility in our infrastructure to respond to whatever the needs are of our community as we're facing climate change and inequity and um, and frankly even not just racial racial tension but the economic inequities that we need to knit back together to have a really healthy society. Um, and you know the the other thing I'll just say to you, Michael, is that you know leaders like you and and many others who are here um, today who invest in our community, we need to listen carefully to you because what's critical is that we, we need people to believe, invest, weigh in, and own, right? Because now there are options to work from anywhere, which means that we've got to be even more competitive to keep people loving the place they live and wanting to be here. Um, and that's why this conversation is so, uh, so not just fun, but really informative uh, for me and I'm sure for others who are listening. As we end this, this great conversation here amongst two amazing people, uh, <laughs> I wanted to say let's live on a lighter note. I mean, you know, I know, you, uh, you know the, 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 the family. What, what, what will you and the family do when you've got your second vaccine and we're, we're in, in, the, in the June 15th in the perfect world where everything's maybe trying to get back to normal? What, what are you going to do, and you and Mike and Brendan, what are you guys going to do? What, what, what's your family going to do? So as funny as it sounds, the thing I've been missing is going to watch a baseball game outside Ooh. with sunflower seeds and, you know, a big hat and, you know, I, and doing that with Mike, with Brendan and Mike. And, you know, I, 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 I just miss it. I miss it so much. So that's really what we're going to go, some people are going to go to Disneyland. We're going to go to a baseball game. Yeah. What, Michael, what about you and Jake and Jen? Well, there was a time when I felt like, oh my gosh, God, there's, there's another gala to go to. There's another, you know, and, and uh, so I think Jen and I desire to dress up 
uh, go to our favorite nonprofit gala for a great cause, and just hang out with people that we haven't seen and, and, and you know, get to see you and others and, and other great elected officials in this county. Uh, we, we'd love to just be able to get back. Jen mentioned that this Saturday. She said, gosh, I wish there was just an event we could go to on Saturday beyond just an outdoor dinner or something like that. So uh, we all yearn for some of the things that maybe we took for granted or maybe we, we were maybe thought we were tired of. And, and uh, as it turns out, we weren't. <laughs> well, listen, keep, keep building a great Silicon Valley, Michael. Thank you for letting me hang out with you. And to the leadership group, thank you for all you did to save lives during COVID-19. Um, I really can't thank you enough. Thank you all. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, we'll see you soon.